inazamu ijwi ryanje hejuru umenyeshi byibibihe nafashe numwanya ndaguhamagara umenyeshi byisarura today i'm very glad to have alexander vernon from canada and he's a lawyer uh, and also professor at detroit mercy school of law and he's going to give us more insight as to the current immigration in Canada. So, Professor uh, uh, Vernon, I'm going to give you time to introduce yourself to the public, who you are, what you do, what people should know about you. And this Thank is you. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be with you and your audience. So, as you said, I'm seeking, speaking to you from Canada, <clears throat> where I live. Uh, but I work at Detroit Mercy School of Law, which is a, a law school in Detroit, in, in, in Michigan, in the United States. Uh, we're, we're kind of uniquely located uh, right at the border of Canada and the United States. And we have a partnership with the University of Windsor Law School, where we offer a dual JD program. So we offer the opportunity for people to study Canadian and U.S. law and get certification in both of those areas. And as a matter of fact, in my immigration law clinic, you know, often, you know, uh, a good half or even a majority of the students are Canadian students. And so although I'm licensed in Michigan and practice only U.S. immigration law, due to our proximity to the border and the fact that I live in Canada yeah. and many of my students live in Canada, we often end up uh, touching on Canadian immigration issues and collaborating with Canadian immigration lawyers to try and find pathways for our, for our clients. Wow, very interesting. So today I'm going to, well, I want to give us insight as to the safe third country agreement that was signed between the US and Canada. And if you can walk us through what is, if anybody hear that agreement, what should do we know? Or what can, can you tell to the public or share with the public? Sure. Absolutely. So the safe third country agreement was uh, signed between the two countries and the basic idea is that each country recognizes the other country as a, as a safe country for asylum seekers that has processes in place to um, make sure that people get hearings. Um, and uh, as, as you know, from, from the country's point of view, it's, uh, it's, it's like a, a, a case management strategy. Uh, whereby they want to eliminate people choosing which country they want to have a claim in. And they say, the first country you arrive in, that's where you should make your refugee claim. Now, practically speaking, if you look at the map of North America, you can see that Canada is surrounded by oceans on the east, oceans on the west, oceans on the north. And on the south, we have this large border with the United States. So uh, for most people coming, trying to get to Canada, uh, they would pass through the United States, which is 10 times more populous, has, you know, more commercial flights coming in and out of. And for some people who are literally um, walking from where they're fleeing from, they would have to pass through the United States. So the, before this agreement was put in place, the flow was from the United States to Canada. People were trying to go from the United States because they thought they might have a better chance at making a refugee claim in Canada. And so from that standpoint, it was really Canada that was the driving force behind this agreement. They wanted to manage the flow of asylum seekers and, in fact, reduce the flow of asylum seekers coming from the United States. And it was Canada that uh, was the driving force behind the agreement to say, look, these people should stay in the United States and, and, and go through the process there. Um, so it's been in place since uh, you know, the early, early part of this century, 2002, I believe, was when it was uh, put into place. And um, most recently, uh, there have been several challenges on the Canadian side, whereby Canadian organizations and, um, and certain applicants uh, brought suit in Canadian court to say, look, um, the conditions in the United States are such that people do not have um, uh, the same opportunities to apply for asylum in Canada. In fact, they are impeded by the fact that the United States detains asylum seekers at a higher rate, that um, certain kinds of asylum claims are less likely to succeed, particularly gender-based asylum claims, uh, asylum claims that are determined to be private actor asylum claims, gang persecution claims, uh, extreme domestic violence-based claims, 
that they're less likely to proceed uh, successfully in the United States, but Canadian uh, jurisprudence, Canadian immigration law might be more likely to recognize people with those cases as, as um, refugees that could be accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, most recently, uh, <clears throat> the federal court in Canada ruled that in fact, the Safe Third Country Agreement violated the rights of people who are on Canadian soil seeking to make refugee claims in Canada and um, found it unconstitutional. However, the court suspended uh, the decision for six months to allow the Canadian government to uh, come up with a legislative or policy response. Mm -hmm. um, the government of Canada decided to appeal the decision and most recently they successfully convinced the federal court to extend the suspension of the decision. So in fact, the safe third country agreement is still in effect. And then, um, you know, perhaps I can tell you how it operates yes. uh, for people who are trying to get to Canada uh, and, and seek asylum. So this agreement is, is in place mm -hmm. and uh, it means that, um, uh, and it's in place, it's in effect at the land ports of entry between Canada and the United States. It generally speaking does not apply for people who fly into Canada through, through airports yeah. and it, it doesn't apply for people who arrive by, by, by sea or, or by river or boat. There are, there are ferry crossings between the two countries and it yeah. doesn't apply at those ferry crossings. So it applies at land ports of entry. What it means is somebody who comes to the port of entry, so the, here uh, where I am in, in Windsor, we have a, a bridge yeah. with, Canada, with the United States and we have a tunnel. Yeah. Um, somebody who comes to that official port of entry, the Safe Third Country Agreement applies unless they meet an exception to the agreement yeah. They'll be found ineligible to make a refugee claim in Canada. They will actually receive an exclusion order uh, and they'll be sent back to the United States. Now, um, that's one thing. Uh, the problem becomes when they are sent back to the United States, they then encounter U.S. customs officials yes. who will then question them. And, um, you know, if they came to the United States legally on a visitor's visa, yeah. The, the basis of that visitor's visa is that they are coming to the United States for a temporary purpose and then they're leaving. Correct. Now, yeah. now the U.S. border officials have evidence that these people actually have a fear of returning to their country and tried to apply for asylum. So, so they say, ah, you know, so even if you came with a legal visitor's visa, you're in violation of that visa and you probably obtained that visa fraudulently because you intended to stay, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so the problem becomes that they're found to be in violation of their status if they had status. Yes. And of course, if they came and they didn't have status, they're found to be in yes. violation of immigration laws. Uh, and they, very often they end up detained. So the United States Customs and Border Protection officials can detain them, uh, yeah. put them in removal proceedings. Uh, and so they end up worse off than they were yeah. before for trying to go to Canada. So that's wow. one problem. Wow, interesting. So let me get just clear here. So if if I have a valid visa and it hasn't expired, and I'm trying to cross to Canada and I'm cut by you know pushed back by the Canadian officers, go back to US, even though the valid visa is still there, but you can be quickly you know put into the whole proceedings and and be deported if you even if your visa is still valid. Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, and it, 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 it doesn't necessarily happen quickly. So, I mean, so that, but they can determine that uh, you came on a valid visa, but you obviously had an intent to stay in, in the United States, even though you say, well, I just tried to go to Canada. <laughs> but uh, they will put you in removal proceedings. Yeah. Um, you will have your opportunity to present your case before an immigration judge, but essentially you could be put in, in removal proceedings and facing deportation. Now, yes. for some people, um, they may actually have a removal order. Maybe they don't even know about it because maybe when they came across the southern border, if they if they came across the southern border, maybe they got caught. Yeah. Removal. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and um, so that could be a problem too. They could find out they have a removal order they they weren't even aware of, and they those folks could be sent back without seeing an immigration judge. But for the most part. Um, they may get to see an immigration judge. They may they may still be detained. Uh, they may face a bond uh, to, in order to get released. That maybe they can't 
pay the bond or maybe the judge says no i think you're a flight risk and i'm not going to release you at all that's happened to some of my clients so it, it can put people in a very very bad situation position yes wow so i, I mentioned um maybe i didn't mention but there are some exceptions to the agreement exactly okay. oh, going to be my next um, <laughs> and so if people have relatives in canada they may have an exception to the agreement now it's important that they consult with a canadian immigration lawyer yeah. because it's very specific relatives that can be an exception to the agreement um and those relatives have to have a very specific status in canada they could be canadian citizens canadian permanent residents they could be people who have a, a canadian refugee claim pending um and, and again they have to be that specific relative it could be you know a spouse or domestic partner parent child uncle aunt unfortunately cousin is not a qualifying relationship and you have to be able to prove that relationship but if you have one of those qualifying relationships and the person is in that qualifying status you may have an exception to the agreement you yeah. may be able to go to the official port of entry and uh and access refugee protection in canada right. um but again very well, complicated because the there are now uh sort of um whoops i, I think uh yeah, you. I can hear you. You, you can hear me. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. Perfect. There, there are now um, grounds of ineligibility uh, for people that have already filed for asylum in the United States. So, so on top of it, now mm -hmm. there's a recent law that was passed in Canada saying that if you filed for asylum in the United States, you may not actually be eligible to apply for refugee status in Canada, but there is um, there is still the possibility for lesser forms of protection that if if granted could lead to somebody getting permanent residency in the United States. So that's not to say that somebody who has already filed for asylum in the United States has no possibility of relief in Canada, but they really should consult with a Canadian lawyer Canadian. Uh, about the particularities of their of their case. Yeah, so uh, there, there are some other. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm, I was just going to say that the reason why I'm asking these questions, I know the cases of, we here in Maine, we having the uh, the border with the Canada, and I've seen people okay, move, coming here and then move to Canada, and I want to make sure that they're not putting themselves into high risk, and I want to get as much as information so they can they can be informed when they are making those decisions. And so Absolutely. If you can share with them, it would be good. So that's what I want to say. Absolutely. Um, so if they think they have a family member exception, they should check it out with a Canadian lawyer to make sure that Canada is going to be satisfied that it's a family member exception. Um, there are some other exceptions. If somebody is an unaccompanied minor, so a child under the age of 18 who doesn't have any parents in Canada or the United States, they may be able to proceed to the border. Um, there's a, a kind of a curious exception uh, for people that... Um, well, if they have a visa to go to Canada, if they have a visitor's visa, study permit, something like that, mm -hmm. they can be able to go to the border. Or if they, if they come from a country that doesn't require a visa for Canada, but requires one from the United States, uh, mm -hmm. the current examples that I'm aware of are Mexico and Hong Kong, yeah. then they, they can also go to the border and, um, and they will not be, uh, they, they will be not be subject to the, to the agreement if they can, prove that um, and and lastly there is um, something called the public interest exception mm -hmm. which is very narrowly applied by the Canadians and it refers to people that um, are, are, are charged with convicted of a crime that faces the death penalty either in the United States or in their country of origin it's very narrowly applied and it doesn't really apply to most people's cases um, and and there's also an exception for people that are that are stateless, yeah. that don't have a country that recognizes them. So um, there's another big area that I haven't talked about, uh, and it's not really an exception to the agreement, but it refers back to my original statement that the agreement applies at the at the land ports of entry with with the United States. It doesn't apply to people who are inside of Canada. So if you are inside of Canada. Yeah. but you were in the United States previously, you, you could potentially still make a refugee claim in Canada. 
Um, so some clever, I don't know who the first person to think of this was, realized that, okay, if I can't go to the port of entry, if yeah. I'll get turned away, if I go to the port of entry, yeah. what if I, if I find somewhere where I can sneak across yeah. and cross illegally or irregularly into Canada yes. and get myself inside Canada? So mm -hmm. then that person would, um, that person would be, would be allowed to make a refugee claim. So what happened was mm -hmm. that people started to cross at these irregular ports of entry. They, they, uh, and one of them is a place called Roxham Road in ups upstate New York. And it became kind of an unofficial border crossing. So yeah. you would have the Canadian police there saying, oh, you're not allowed to cross here, but they wouldn't stop people for the most part. They would allow them to come into Canada uh, and so that became a way for people who could not go to the official port of entry and make a refugee claim, they, it, it would be tolerated. They would be allowed to come across the border irregularly. Mm -hmm. You know, the Canadians might even tell them, hey, it's illegal to cross here, but they would allow them to come in. Oh, they were, uh, and then they would be allowed to make a refugee claim. All right. So it's important to note that that is, that is not possible right now because of the coronavirus pandemic. So because of the coronavirus pandemic, the Canadian government has said, if we catch people crossing at the irregular crossing or at the, you know, the unofficial crossing uh, or anything like that, yeah. we'll, we'll send them back to the United States and we'll tell them, you know, you can, you can come again when, when the coronavirus emergency is over. So it's this curi curious situation where most people that wanted to go to Canada had to cross, you know, sort of illegally exactly. or irregularly into Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, but now they can't even do that because of the coronavirus pandemic. So people are, um, I, I don't know what people are doing. I don't know if people are trying to sneak across in other places. Yeah. Uh, I'm concerned about that because obviously we're getting into the colder months of the year and uh, yeah. surprisingly easy for somebody who's not familiar with Canadian cold weather uh to get lost and, yeah. and you know and there were times in the past when people did get lost and and, and die or lose fingers or toes so we're quite concerned wow. about that but for the time being you know people um either have to wait until the irregular crossings are tolerated again yeah or wait until the canadian courts make a final decision on the safe third country agreement challenge, or um, um, maybe the Canadian government will legislate or otherwise alter the policy, but people are sort of stuck in a waiting game. So let's go back to this. Uh, this was the, 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 the safe third country agreement was uh, found unconstitutional, uh, but right. they still they, they gave the Canadian uh, government an extension for how long again? Well, it was originally extended until I believe July 22nd. Yeah. Uh, sorry, until 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 January 22nd of 2021. Okay. Uh, I believe was the date, but just recently the court extended it further, and there is um, there's a, a Supreme Court will will take up the matter. I believe uh, in February of 2021. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So let, let, I'm trying to understand. Let's say for the. So if this was an agreement between two countries. Is there the cases of people crossing from Canada to U.S. and and, yeah. and is that equally shared? Or you say that most people are crossing from U.S. to Canada, but also we have people from Canada to going to U.S. and what 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 happened to them one day? Is there any cases that you may know? That <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, very few that would be going from Canada to the U.S. because they thought they had a better chance in the U.S. Right. What the, the, the crossings that I've heard about were mostly people crossing back into the United States illegally or irregularly because they had, um, maybe they had come from the United States and crossed into Canada because they hoped to get a better chance in Canada. Yeah. And then they lost their case in Canada. Uh, and instead of facing deportation back to their country, they thought, well, let me go back to the United States because maybe my family is there or maybe I was working in the United States before. So there have been people trying to sneak back into the United States, especially if, they, if they've been unsuccessful in Canada. Um, you know, people, um, I, I suppose there would be a number of people going from Canada to the United States because they have relatives there. Or um, I can think of maybe one area where people would 
possibly have a better chance in the United States if they were Cubans. Mm. Uh, maybe not currently, but under the previous administration, uh, Cubans could benefit from something called the Cuban Adjustment Act, where, whereby if they were paroled or allowed into the United States, yeah. they could file for permanent residency after a year in the United States without really even addressing whether or not they had a, had a fear of going back. You yeah. know, that was the policy in the past. Very good. And the, the, the other question I have is, so I, since the current administration has been very tough on, on so many immigrants, so have you seen the increase of people seeking, like a crossing the border from U.S. to Canada period, compared to the previous administration? Yes. Um, and, and, you know, most people studying this issue have said that, so, so there always had been some traffic from the U.S. to Canada before this administration. Uh, and and there, there, there have been times in the past when that traffic increased, uh, particularly after September 11th, yes. uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, there were fairly large flows, you know, because there was a backlash against immigrants and refugees, particularly from Muslim countries or perceived to be Muslim countries. So there were increases in those days. But um, definitely in January of 2017, there, there, were, there were large numbers coming in. Uh, and many of them, uh, you know, I remember talking to some of them and, and mm. they showed me videos that they had been sent by friends. Uh, they were in reaction to um, the, uh, the Muslim ban yes. uh, and, uh, and certain remarks that President Trump had made when he first came into office and when he was a candidate. Yes. And, in, and also in reaction to the Canadian Prime Minister uh, tweeting uh, that uh, Canada would welcome people uh, regardless oh, yes. of their religion. And so, you know, some people interpreted this as, oh, you know, Canada is saying welcome, we should go. Yes. And, um, and then they would, I, I saw videos circulating around of, of Haitian and African refugees in Montreal celebrating the fact that they had been welcomed into Canada. And that message kind of got around uh, to other people and they said, well, we're gonna try too. Yes. So, um, I, I, and you know, uh, my experience has been because I encountered many of these folks either when they didn't make it into Canada and were detained in, yeah. in the United States, uh, mostly people of color, uh, Haitians, uh, you know, West Africans, East yeah. Africans. Um, so uh, it was an interesting reflection to me as to why these individuals seemed the most likely to decide that they didn't want to take their chances in the United States anymore. And, and, and flee to Canada. So, so you, you are, you're a law professor and you probably have been doing this for quite some time. And what have you yourself seen as the changes in terms of immigration policy here in the US that you, you, you haven't seen and that you're saying that this is concerning or this is not good for people who are, you know, who are running away from the, their countries because it's not safe. What have you seen, some of the major sure. changes that you've seen that, that will concern you? You know, very interestingly, um, there has been very little legislative action on immigration. So it's very hard to get Congress and the Senate and the president to agree on passing laws. But what we're seeing is the ability of the president to, the president to act unilaterally through executive orders and other regulatory changes to, to change immigration law. One of the important areas is the, um, well, the president appoints the attorney general and the attorney general has the power to look at the way that certain issues have been interpreted by the immigration courts and the board of Im immigration appeals. And if the attorney general, who's the representative of the president or the appointee of the president, yeah. doesn't like the way the law has developed, he or she can, can certify a case to him or herself and change the law. So, and that, and that did happen. There was uh, a line of cases that developed the law on domestic violence related asylum claims mm -hmm. uh, to the point that the Board of Immigration Appeals had recognized that in some circumstances, individuals fleeing domestic violence at the hands of partners uh, who the state was unable to control mm -hmm. could be recognized as members of a particular social group that would grant them the possibility of refugee protection, of, of, of asylum relief. The attorney general uh, didn't like that, well, really the president didn't like that. Yeah. And so he certified that case to himself and issued a decision that, that uh, changed that law and made it very difficult for people uh, with those kind of cases to win asylum. That was a big 
change. Yeah. Um, other uh, things include um, increased use of detention, uh, it, which is within this, the discretion of the administration to uh, decide not to release people who are seeking asylum uh, or to request higher bonds from people, set higher bonds. Yeah. Uh, there have been attacks on work authorization. So there are new regulations that make it harder for people to get work, uh, work authorization. They have to wait a year. Yeah. Uh, before they can even apply for work authorization. Mm -hmm. uh, if they work illegally, uh, it may impact their case. They may not be eligible for asylum. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of squeezing people from, from both ends, right? Right. Um, and, uh, also, the, 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 the number of people who used to come in the U.S., so the resettlement uh, process of uh, getting an Im immigrant from outside the country coming here every year was like, it has very high now. It's been reduced to very, very low numbers. And also right. those are the things that you've seen also the, the changing around. Yes, so um, I think the 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 uh, the numbers have been reduced to I believe it's fifteen thousand either mm -hmm. for this year or for the coming year, and the United States is probably not even going to uh, resettle that amount. Um, you know, going going from um, well back in the in the eighties, uh, sort of in the in the Cold War years, the numbers were as high as two hundred thousand. So. A very very significant reduction in the number of refugees resettled when when the the total number of refugees worldwide has only gone up i mean there are there are more people that are fleeing uh up from their countries than has ever been in any time in history and at this time the united states has, has basically closed the doors that's so exactly very what I was concerning going to, that was that was going to be my my question because what do you think about like for instance the if you see the amount the people who are now fleeing their countries and going without any place to go, and it, and I think if you look at the UNH, uh, United States Refugee Settlement, to say that it's gone to up to 70 point, 70 point eight million people who are around and not having any place to leave, and yet the U.S. is closing the border. What do you think? What why do you think is the reason behind that is: Do you have anything you can can think of? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's driven by sort of a xenophobic uh, policy um, and and a, a desire, you know, on the part of the the, the, the the base that supports this administration and and the people advising the president to shut the doors. Um, you know, um, so the resettlement. Um, you know, it's been reduced to the point that it's not a viable option for people to, to try and come to the United States. Okay. And then again, people who try and help themselves to come to the United States by, you know, walking up from the southern border um, are now facing policy walls there. So I didn't even talk about the southern border situation, but um, right now the situation is similar to Canada. They're using the coronavirus pandemic as a pretext to expel people who are trying to cross, no questions asked. I mean, I think there, there's a limited exception if they, if they are alleging that they are subject to, that they're victims of human trafficking or they're subject to torture in Mexico, mm -hmm. they may be allowed to uh, present some sort of a case to an immigration officer, but otherwise they're sending them back to Mexico, no questions asked um, because of the pandemic. That's whether they present themselves at the port of entry or if they are caught trying to enter illegally. But even before then, you have the Remain in Mexico policy, which they, they call the Migrant Protection Protocols, which has nothing to do with protecting migrants, where, whereby um, people who presented themselves at the port of entry lawfully and said, I'm here and I want to seek asylum, they were told, okay, you can have your case, you can have a court hearing, but you have to wait for your hearing in Mexico. Um, and um, you know, so large numbers of people are are sort of stuck with no, you know, the Mexican government doesn't have the capacity or the willpower or whatever to set up refugee camps for these folks. So they're sort of informal refugee camps with no sanitation, no uh, pipe water uh, being set up in, in the most dangerous places in Mexico. And that's where these these uh, these people who come to the southern border have been stuck. Others of them. So funny enough, the United States has concluded what it considers to be safe third country agreements with um, places like Guatemala and El Salvador, places that generate a lot of refugees themselves. Yeah. 
And so some folks have been uh, sent back or sent to those countries yeah. uh, and told to apply for asylum in those countries. We're in the middle of, of uh, accounting after the federal election yeah. at the time we're doing this interview. We don't know for sure what the result is, but uh, you can be sure that if, if, the, if, if, pres if, if Joe Biden is declared president-elect, that there will be a, a, an immigration transition team uh, that I think will be um, in contact with immigration and refugee organizations who will certainly be putting their policy priorities forward. And uh, I certainly will be, you know, uh, trying to reach out and, and push the priority of refugees that are stuck overseas in refugee camps or stuck across the border. Uh, so I think, you know, for, for your, uh, your listeners, uh, that they should push um, their organizations, uh, reach out to their representatives uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that these folks are not forgotten. Uh, and, and make it a priority of, of, a, of an incoming administration if, if, we, if we have a change of administration mm -hmm. to make that a priority for, for the new administration. Very good. So we're about to conclude and I'm going, I always, before I end, I always uh, give my, uh, my, my guest the chance to share something that concerns, concerns them. If there's something that you really think it related to the immigration, that's, you will say, you go to sleep, you say, I can't believe this is happening. Is there anything that you, that you have that concerns you? And what, what, what should you say? What can you say about it? There, there are so many things. But uh, so uh, as a Canadian, mm -hmm. it concerns me that um, I think that Canada has such a, a reputation uh, in the United States. People think, oh, Canada is really welcoming refugees. And, and part of that is true, right? Uh, and Canadians feel good about the fact that we welcome refugees, that we flew in so many people from Syria. Um, but the reality is that, that Canada in a, is in a position to pick and choose the refugees that they want to resettle, um, you know, because it's so hard to get to Canada. So they can, they can pick people from refugee camps and they can bring them here. Uh, but we have this policy where we're re rejecting people who, who come to Canada from the United States because they're fleeing persecution and that the yes. government persists in turning a blind eye to the horrific conditions in the United States and insists on this fiction that the United States is, is somehow a safe country for asylum seekers and, and we can just push them back to the United States. So that, I mean, I have encountered people uh, who have, have had the most compelling refugee claims imaginable who went to the Canadian border, were yeah. sent back by the Canadian government, ended up in jail in the United States, you know, wearing an orange jumpsuit, um, mm -hmm. you know, fearing persecution, being threatened by immigration officials that they could be deported to their country. This, as a Canadian, this really hurts me that, that, uh, um, that this is happening. And I, I think uh, that Canada needs to do more to deserve uh, a reputation of being welcoming to, to immigrants. Oh, interesting. So, has since the U.S. have been squeezing the number of people who come from a refugee camp or the number of resettlement people, has the Canada increased the number at least if you compare it from other years, or is the same? In or? fact, they have. No, they they have increased to the point that Canada uh, is now leading the world in in uh, refugee resettlement, um, which is admirable, which is good. Oh, okay. Uh, but it, it doesn't it doesn't excuse our failings in other areas, I believe. And so that's that's the concern that's close to my heart is that we need to do much more for vulnerable people. Absolutely. I totally agree with you because myself uh, for coming from DRC Congo, the country that have been affected by the conflict for many years, the country that have lost millions of lives and people have been running out of Congo and finding a safety somewhere else. And for me to see that those who are begging for safety in the new home and being pushed away, it's just like really heartbreaking. And, and uh, I hope these countries, like countries, I mean, Canada is a big, it's a large country and has less population compared to the US. They always think they can even increase more and bring millions and they will still have a room for them. But yet you don't see that happening. Uh, like, like, like you wish, but uh, yeah, these are the issues that we can talk and go on and on. There's so much to tell, to tell, but 
at the end, I'm going to give you the last word as your professor, your family, you, you have a family, and what can you say to the public as something, it could be a hopeful word or word of wisdom or sure. advice, something they can share with our viewer so they can go home and say, oh, this is good. And yeah, anything you can share with the public. Never forget where you came from and recognize that your experience, uh, for, uh, your, your, your culture that you bring from your country uh, enriches our societies uh, in Canada and the United States. And share what you have learned uh, from your experience. You know, being Congolese, being Jamaican, I was actually born in Jamaica myself. Mm -hmm. uh, this can only serve to enrich um, Canada, the United States, or wherever you, you end up. And, um, and please, please, please encourage those who have made it to safety not to forget those who are left behind. There's a distressing trend in some immigrant communities that the first generation that makes it to safety in a new country, they, are, they sometimes become quite intolerant of the newcomers. Yes. And they say they're not like us. You know, they didn't work hard. You know, they're different. Maybe they're even terrorists or criminals. And they shut the door, you know? Uh, so yes. to the extent that, uh, <laughs> I, you know, my brothers and sisters in the African community, don't let this happen in your community. Remember those who are left behind. Very well said. Uh, I really, I think that can resonate with everybody. Never forget where you came from. But also, you don't want to shut the door that you once you want once wanted to be open for you for the rest of us. Right. The same, you know, the same purpose. So, thank you so much. I, 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 if you if you have any more information, you can send them to me, and and I will share with the public. And I'm very glad we have this conversation. But also, I appreciate your time and taking your time out of your busy schedule and talking to me. So, good luck with everything that you do and. I hope everything goes well for the whole uh, country here in the U.S. Uh, relative to the elections. So thank you thank again. Thank you so much. Yes. It's a great, great pleasure. Hope to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you so much.